Well, uh, we all have pasts, as uh, we'll find out today, and, and, and ex exposed to us by the careful review of what Darwin said. Uh, my past is that uh, I, I used to be the, the Sterling Professor of Geology and Geophysics when I was a, a little kid. Then I grew up, and I'm now emeritus. But I also used to be uh, the uh, curator of meteorites and planetary science in Peabody Museum. And, and Keith Thompson was my boss. I had a, every day I had to go and bow down and say, my lord, and, and, and <laughs> they would allow that. But even farther back, something is more remarkable happened. That is, I didn't become a competitor of Keith Thompson in biology for a very good reason that ties in directly with today's speech. I thought for a while at the request of my mother primarily that I'd become a medical missionary. So I was thinking about taking a medical course, but I, of course I had to go through college first. And one of the things that you take when you're in college if you want to be thinking of medical school is comparative anatomy. Now I went to Wheaton College. Wheaton College produced Billy Graham. It is not a, a, a creationist school, it was, but it was tolerated that if you thought creationism, it wasn't wrong. And I took comparative anatomy from a guy who didn't believe in evolution. And as I had sat there and dissected my cat and all the other animals that I did, and this guy would say, a common God means a common creation. I said, this is nonsense. I, I can't go through with this. And I said, I will abandon biology because it's the work of the devil and go into chemistry. And that was what changed my life. Otherwise, I would have been here competing with Keith Thompson for the glories of biology, as he himself has been able to show to you hey, he, is a, he is a proficient member of. Now, Keith Thompson has done things, too, that you may not be aware of. Some of them are actually worthy of talking about and not hidden or subject to libel. And that is a, a bunch of fishermen off uh, an Indian Ocean caught a creature that should have died a long time ago and become extinct. It was called a coelacanth. And they caught this creature and they brought it to uh, Keith. I guess they figured he'd, if anybody would enjoy eating a coelacanth, it would be Keith Thompson. <laughs> Instead, he did what the scientists were doing, not a good gourmet. He chopped it up and dissected it and made, it, made an understanding of what it was all about. And the world became enriched by the knowledge of this creature that would, should have been smart enough to have died some time in the Cretaceous, I think. But uh, anyway, he, uh, now Keith, has, because of this, has been aware and capable of understanding all forms of life, past and present and future, uh, hopefully future. And uh, as I hope you have a future to be able to discuss it with. And uh, today he's going to talk about the one guy who tried to make sense as well of this thing, and that's Darwin. We heard all about Jefferson last time. Today we're going to hear all about Darwin. And Keith can now start talking if he gets up here in time. <laughs> oh, Carl, thank you. I had, I'd forgotten how much I missed the morning bowing and scraping. It uh, <laughs> became a real habit. Uh, uh, I was going to say those were the days, but I don't want to do that. Um, it's a long time ago since I was on the faculty here at Yale, and it's so nice to see many of my friends from those days here. Um, and I'd really like to thank the Terry Committee for inviting me to give this series of lectures, which as I said on Tuesday, it's really uh, an, an awesome responsibility. Um, I would like to mention uh, Laura Lee Field, who, uh, from the Office of the University Secretary, who has looked after Linda and myself with a, a care and a grace that we are absolutely not used to, but um, want to be. So uh, we'll try and keep that up. But I also want to mention uh, Jean Thompson Black, uh, executive editor of the Yale University Press. <coughs> I have to mention her because she edits my books, and if I, if I get on the wrong side of Jean, I am in serious trouble. So, <coughs> excuse me. In my last lecture, I, s I said what I wanted to do, at least in the first two lectures, was look at this whole question of the relationship between science and religion. And this so-called conflict between the two uh, from a different point of view from most people. Because uh, it seems to me, as I said, the, there is the great dramatic image of Galileo and the tribunal, 
But the much more interesting thing, or at least as interesting thing to me, is Galileo for the first time realizing that there was something dramatically important uh, that he needed to investigate that was going to turn his whole life upside down and not necessarily for the better. When Thomas Jefferson looked at geology, which he loved, and how it fitted with his view of uh, religion and particularly with creation, he found that they didn't meet at all. And as I showed, he gave up geology. He just closed his mind to the whole subject and stayed with his religious views. What I want to do today is talk about Charles Darwin, who uh, very similarly uh, came against this conflict between his scientific views and his religious views. Scientific views that he'd actually uh, created for himself, brand new science of, of uh, natural selection, and how he dealt with the problem. And he was very different from uh, Thomas Jefferson because he was a quintessential warrior who would never let anything drop in the way that Jefferson managed to do. Uh, one of the themes that I mentioned in my last lecture was that it's hard to find things that are really new in this subject. Things seem to be repeated over and over. The natural theology of Paley in 1801 was just an echo of uh, John Ray's The Wisdom of God Manifest in the Works of His Creation, published in 18, I mean 1670 odd. And uh, then also was completely there in Cicero's De Natura Deorum on the nature of the gods of the first century BC. Well, similarly, evolution, as w what we call evolution, which was previously called development theory or transmutation theory, was around well before Charles Darwin was born. Uh, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, uh, popularized uh, the, the subject. And his ideas were taken up by Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. Everybody knows about Lamarckian evolution. Um, and in 1844, the subject was made immensely popular by the work of a man. It was anonymous at first, but it turned out to be Robert Chambers um, in Scotland, who wrote a book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. It was immensely popular because the 1840s were a time of great social unrest and even revolution, in it, particularly across the channel in Europe. And uh, it was a message of, of change, that people weren't stuck in their natural little slot to which God had assigned them or society had assigned them, but there was room for, if you like, the cat to look at the king. And of course, the scientists absolutely hated it, largely because a lot of what he wrote of his geological science was actually, as it turned out to be, even then, wrong. But it didn't matter because it was immensely popular, and, and that counts. So it was probably Chambers that uh, Tennyson was thinking about in, uh, in Memoriam, which, as you know, was written in 1849 when he wrote about nature red in tooth and claw, and even more pertinently, um, are God and nature then at strife, that nature lends such evil dreams, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life. There is Darwinian natural selection in a nutshell. The, the individuals are sacrificed in order that the type is preserved. And he, he was only capturing, again, the uh, ideas of Thomas Malthus on population and, indeed, the French botanist de Candolle, who had written, all nature is at war with itself. So these sorts of ideas were very much in the air when Charles Darwin was a young man, and particularly when he came back from the Beagle. One of my favorite references to development theory from before Darwin uh, is the following. Uh, from a novel of uh, 1847. You know, all is development. The principle is perpetually going on. First there was nothing, then there was something, then I forget the next, I think there were shells, then fishes, then we came, let's see, did we come next? Never mind. We came at last. And at the next change, there will be something very superior to us, something with wings. That's it. We were fishes, and I believe we shall be crows. <laughs> that was Benjamin Disraeli in his novel, Tancred. 
Now, uh, uh, Disraeli was a pretty good writer, actually, but Jefferson and Darwin were remarkable writers. Um, they both wrote so simply and with such clarity. Um, you only have to think of the Declaration of Independence, and Darwin's origin of species can easily be given to writing composition classes today, uh, 150 years after its publication. Uh, most of what he wrote was quite expository, but a few passages are quite lyrical, and everybody's favorite choice, obviously, but I'm going to rehearse it for you anyway, though you could probably re recite it along with me. It's the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. It is interesting to complement, contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing in the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. And then skipping forwards. Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst the planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. It's a lovely passage, and the interesting thing about it uh, is this phrase, this view of life having been breathed into a few forms or one. What did he mean by breathed by? Now, he very carefully left it. It could be sort of literal, it could be figurative, it could be a wonderful metaphor. He just left it there. And I suppose nobody paid very much attention to it. Anyway, one obvious rhetorical purpose of this glorious paragraph is to end the book on a very uh, lyrical and upbeat note because so much of it involved uh, what uh, Tennyson had referred to, the, the, the nature read in tooth and claw. <coughs> Favor, survival of favored races meant the not survival of a great deal of others. Direct and indirect struggle, competition, disease, want, all those things drive natural selection uh, so that nature is full of ugliness as well as beauty. So what Darwin is doing here in this grandeur of this view of life when it all depends on such competition and nastiness is he's setting a direct uh, antithesis to the natural theology of, uh, of Paley and, and Ray. And in an early version, which he wrote out in 19, 1844 and didn't publish, that was the year that Chambers did publish, and I'm, I'm sure there's a connection with the delay. He said, it accords with what we know of the laws impressed by the creator on matter, that the production and extinctions of forms should, like the birth and death of individuals, be the result of secondary means. It is derogatory that the creator of countless universes should have made by individual acts of his will the myriads of creeping parasites and worms which since the earliest days of life have swarmed over the land and in the depths of the seas. We cease to be astonished that a group of animals should have been formed to lay their eggs in the bowels and flesh of other sensitive beings, that some animals should live by and even delight in cruelty, that animals should be led away by false instincts, and that annually there should be an incalculable waste of pollen, eggs, and immature beings. For in all this we see the inevitable consequences of one great law. And then he wrote, there is a symbol grandeur in this view of life. And so that was the early draft of 1844. He's actually setting up an argument against two ideas that were incredibly important uh, and universal at the time. One was natural theology, that God had made everything the way it is and that it was all beautiful. And the other one was that uh, described how we had so much diversity on the face of the earth. As 
people explored across the globe through the 17th and 18th and early 19th century, it became almost imponderable why there were so many different kinds of animals and plants when, in theory, just one or two would, would, have, been, would have been fine. Why were there uh, kangaroos and wallabies in Australia but not in Africa? Why there were polar bears in the north and penguins in the south but not vice versa? How did this extraordinary strangeness of diversity come about? And the prevailing theory was that uh, God had created it that way. And that what he had done was created life at at least 50 different centers of creation. And so each center was different. The Australian center was different from the South American center, the North American from the European, and so on. Um, this is sort of what I referred to earlier as being a saving the phenomenon. Uh, if you think about it, Noah's Ark could not have coped with the problem of why there were wallabies and kangaroos in Australia um, if after the flood everything had been <coughs> restored to, where, to, to, to the Middle East. Um, so this theory was called uh, the theory of special creation. And it was an important theory at the time that Darwin was writing, and clearly he was recruiting against it. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long ago before the first bed of the Silurian system was deposited. They, if I do that, then they seem to me to be ennobled, which is kind of an interesting word. So he was pr proposing a new kind of secular grace, ennobling uh, that did not deny the existence of a creator. It just assigned to the creator only the job of setting things going in the first place, and after that, everything went by secondary laws. And if, if you think about that, that works out quite well because the creator gets the credit for all the good things and all this mayhem and whatnot by which evolution actually, natural selection actually happens is just the result of the secondary laws that happen willy-nilly once you've set things going. So Darwin's writing about this in uh, first in, started writing about this in 1838, just two years after he came back from the Beagle Voyage. And he didn't publish The Origin until 1859. During that time, his religious views changed immensely. And I want to talk a little about that uh, now. Darwin was brought up as a, in a curious but not uncommon combination of Unitarianism and the Church of England. Um, Unitarianism was very popular in the Midlands part of England, the new industrial heartland of England. Um, less so in the capital and, and not so much at all in, in Scotland. But it was there when men tended to be self-made and both men and women were really encouraged to think for themselves. And this was the religious preference of the Wedgwoods, uh, his, his cousins. He married a Wedgwood, his father married a Wedgwood, uh, and also his deist grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Robert Darwin, Charles Darwin's father, was brought up as a Unitarian and then moved over to the Church of England because that was the very fashionable, logical thing to do. And in fact, despite both of those connections, he was a non-believer. Darwin was christened at Shrewsbury Parish Church but never confirmed. His wife-to-be, Emma Wedgwood, was also an ardent Unitarian, but she was confirmed in the Church of England at the age of 18. A dominant feature of the Unitarians, obviously, was their insistence that the discovery of truth about God and Jesus could come through only through personal study and reflection rather than dogma. And this was the approach that Jefferson also followed. And as for Jefferson, intelligent reflection was something that Charles Darwin and Emma were particularly good at. As a young boy of 16, when he went to Edinburgh to medical school, uh, he was probably as a-religious as any 16-year-old boy uh, might be expected to be. He and his older brother, Erasmus, uh, spent the first semester going around from church to church, hoping to find some really good fire and brimstone preaching. And they were largely disappointed. 
And then he wrote a very sad little letter to his sister Caroline from Edinburgh asking for advice. What part of the Bible do you like best? I like the Gospels. Do you know which one of them is reckoned to be the best? Well, as you know, medicine and Charles Darwin didn't uh, fit together, but it is a surprise still that his father then sent him to Cambridge to learn to be a Church of England priest. As he wrote in his, uh, in his autobiography, I do not think the religious sentiment was ever strongly developed in me. But he had to have a career of some sort, so he mugged up his Greek and Latin, made sure that he could swear to the 39 articles of the Church of England, and went to Cambridge. And was a quick study. When he was on the Beagle immediately after Cambridge, he wrote, I was quite orthodox, and I remember being heartily laughed at by several of the officers for quoting the Bible as an on unanswerable authority on some point in morality. I suppose it was the novelty of the argument that amused them. But I gradually came to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, with the Tower of Babel, the t rainbow as a sign, etc., etc., and from its attributing to God the feelings of a vengeful tyrant, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. So he had changed. Now, <clears throat> when he was on the Beagle Voyage, he realized he would never have to be a parson because he would have his mother's fortune when he was 25 and his father's fortune when the old man died, and that was several millions of pounds. So he was never going to have to have a job, and of course, as you know, he never did have a paid job. What he seems to have been hoping for, that he could become like his teacher, the Reverend John Stevens Henslow at Cambridge, uh, a don at Cambridge, uh, perhaps with a little secure living in a church somewhere with a curate to take care of it for him. Uh, I don't know how many of you have taken the train from London to Oxford, but as you do, just before you get to Oxford on the right-hand side of the train, there's lovely fields, and in the distance there, there's this beautiful little church 12th century squat little church. It doesn't have a steeple or anything. And it's Chelsea Church. And Stephen Henslow's, that was his church that he relied upon for an income. It's also, strangely enough, the place where Agatha Christie is buried. Anyway, um, so it was on the Beagle Voyage that he started to have really serious doubts about uh, creation and from the point of view of geology. And there was one thing to read in books how broken up the earth was, as I was talking about in the last lecture, but it was quite a different thing to go out to South America and see it all for yourself. And not only to see how it seemed to be broken up and to have read about the great earthquake of Lisbon of 1755, but when they were at Concepcion, Chile, there was a massive earthquake right under their feet. And the Beagle officers were surveyors and they worked it out before and afterwards that the land in places had been raised eight or ten feet in one afternoon, which led some credence to the view that maybe, if you remember the question of where do mountains come from, is it being driven up by earthquakes and volcanoes, gave some credence to that view. And it was a geologist as he came back from the Beagle Voyage. He uh, set out to be a geologist. He was setting out to write a book on coral reefs and to write the geology of South America, in fact, which he did in two volumes. And one of the first things he did was to take an unpaid position as secretary of the Geological Society of London. He was clearly on this trajectory to be a geologist. But he also had a completely opposite secret life which started to eat away at him because it was only six months after he came back from the Beagle Voyage that he realized that species must transmute or develop, species must change, and that he thought he could find a way, a mechanism for that to happen, which no one else had ever done. Uh, not a modest uh, ambition for a young 26-year-old. He finished the outline of his theory in 1838, and almost exactly the same time married Emma Wedgwood, Emma, who was possibly one of the most devout Christian believers in all of England. 
and you can only guess at the conflicts that arose between the two. They continued to ch attend church together, and on the mo for the moment all was calm on the surface, but he later confided to a friend in a phrase that it's very familiar to you, it's like confessing to a murder. He was working secretly, well, publicly, straightforward, acceptable geologist, he was working on a theory that would subvert his, his wife's uh, religion. And if there, was a, if there was ever a case where there is a tax on new knowledge in the phrase that J.A. Thompson used in the very first of these Terry lectures in eight, eight, 1925, uh, this must be the case because the tax, the price that Darwin paid for working on this theory uh, which he knew would not be very acceptable, uh, really almost did cost him his life. For the rest of his life, for instance, in his study there was always a curtained alcove where he could retire during the day <coughs> as the pressure got too much to, uh, to throw up, if you'll pardon the expression. Now, on the advice of his father, he actually opened his heart to Emma about his doubts. Very dangerous thing to do. My father advised me to carefully conceal my doubts, for he said that he had known extreme misery thus caused by married persons. Things went pretty well until the wife or husband became out of health, and then some women suffered miserably by doubting about the salvation of their husbands, thus making them to suffer likewise. My father added that he had known only his... It, it, he had known during his whole long life only three women who were skeptics. It's interesting. But Darwin couldn't keep any secret from Emma, and so he told her about his doubts, and even before they were married, it was a tremendous, tremendous problem. Uh, she wrote to him, <clears throat> When I am with you, I think all melancholy thoughts about keep out of my head, but since you are gone, some sad ones have forced themselves in a fear that our opinions on the most important subject would differ widely. My reason tells me that honest and conscientious doubts cannot be a sin, but I feel it would be a painful void between us. I thank you from my heart for your openness with me, and I should dread the feeling that you are concealing your opinions from fear of giving me pain. Sometime between his marrying Emma in 1838 and the death of his father in 1849, he gave up all belief in conventional Christianity. And indeed, he wrote in his autobiography afterwards, I, I guess all autobiographies are a little suspect, there's a lot of deja vu there, but I can hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be, to be true. For, for if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. Now, if you think about it, was he making a pun there? Everlasting pun punishment, damnable document? Who knows? Anyway, Darwin died, Robert Darwin died in, in 1848, and then in 1851, his little daughter, uh, Annie, died, the subject of a brilliant book by uh, Darwin's great-grandson, uh, Randall Keynes, called, in this country, anyway, in England, it's called Annie's Box. It has a, a different title here, but it's, if, you, if you want to read anything about the Darwin family, read Randall Keynes' book. So... Thus disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but it was at last complete. The rate was so slow that I felt no distress and have never since doubted for a single second that my conclusion was correct. But he still believed in the existence of God. And he still basically agreed with the natural theology argument that it was impossible that man, that this wonderful universe, including man with his capacity for looking far backwards and far into futurity, was the result of blind chance or necessity. Thus reflecting, I feel, thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of a man, and I deserve to be called a theist. <clears throat> and then, of course, this being Darwin, he immediately starts to take it back. Now, 
I hope you don't mind my reading another passage here. But then arises the doubt. And the doubt is whether the human mind can actually be trusted on this subject. Uh, may not all this be the result of a connection between cause and effect, uh, but prob which probably depends on inherited experience. The probability that the constant inculcation of a belief in God of the minds of children, producing so strong and perhaps an inherited effect on their brains, not yet fully developed, that, they would, that it would be as difficult for them to throw off their belief as God as for a monkey to throw off its instinctive fear and hatred of a snake. Now, in his 1871, uh, The Descent of Man, he goes into great deal, detail into subjects that are still um, very important today, which is whether uh, a sense of religion is something that has a, a natural selective adaptive value uh, that could actually be selected for in natural selection. So, <clears throat> as he traveled around the world, he realized that this theory of special creation wouldn't work. And when he came back and set off to study uh, natural selection and evolution, as I said before, it was a very immodest goal he set to himself. He wrote down in his notebook what he was going to create it was not just a mechanism for evolution, it would be a new system of natural history with capital letters. And psychology will be based on a new foundation. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and history. It was going to be a complete uh, new world view. Now, when the book came out, uh, it had a, a very mixed reception. And I want to read to you one uh, because I really like this one. This was from his old teacher, Adam Sedgwick, the geologist at Cambridge. Uh, if I did not think you a good-tempered and truth-loving man, I should not tell you that, in spite of the great knowledge, store of facts, capital views of the correlations of the various parts of organic nature, admirable hints about the diffusions through wide regions of nearly related organic beings, etc., 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 I have read your book with more pain than pleasure. Parts of it I greatly admired. Parts I laughed until my sides were almost sore. Other parts I read with absolute sorrow because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. Now, <clears throat> in 1878, the Reverend E.B. Pusey at Oxford gave a sermon at St. Mary's Church, the, the, the university church. It, it's a famous sermon called Science and Not Science. And it's remarkable because in this sermon, science having advanced immensely in the period, uh, in the 19th century, Pusey was willing to grant science almost all of its discoveries. It didn't care whether the earth was millions and millions of years old. That was very radical for a Church of England uh, a cleric at the time. He insisted only two points, that the initial creation of life was divine and miraculous, and the exceptionalism of human origins. Other species might evolve, he would grant that. But human evolution origin required divine intervention. And he made a strange accusation against Darwin. It was then so far with a quasi-theological, not a scientific object, that he wrote his book. What did he mean by that? Darwin wishes to overthrow the theory of, nat of special creations. So this is a very interesting subject that people have discussed a great deal. Was special creations a theological theory or a scientific theory? And if Darwin is arguing against it, is he writing a quasi-theological book or a totally scientific book? But of course, this made Darwin absolutely furious. Furious. He said, there's nothing was further from my mind than to write what Pusey has written about me, which, of course, was completely false. That's exactly what he did. 
from beginning to end, Darwin's book is a demolition of the theory of special creations. And if that isn't bad enough, when he wrote the introduction to the 1870, uh, 1871 Descent of Man, he said, oops, have I lost it? Um, I had two objects in view. If I've erred in giving natural selection great power, blah, 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 I have at least, I hope, done good service in aiding to overthrow the dogma of special creation. This is an extraordinary thing. He's writing letters to all his friends, complaining about Pusey, talking about him, accusing him of not believing in God, which, which he clearly did in some way or other. But how could he have claimed that he wasn't destroying the theory of special creations when that's exactly what he set out to do? So if that's puzzling, the next thing is even more puzzling. Confronted with, as he was, with this tremendous tension between his scientific view and conventional religious views, what did he do? In a word, he blinked. Now, he'd known all along that this would be very unpopular, this theory of his. But no sooner the origin had come out, which I think was either October or November of 1859, he worked on a second edition, which came out in January of 1860, so just a few months. And then he yielded to temptation. As I said, the devil whispered into his ear with just a few judicious additions. You could appeal to at least, or at least appease your religious argument, audience. The acceptance of your ideas would be far greater if you added a phrase or two emphasizing a role for the Almighty. Now, who the devil is who spoke to Dr. Darwin, that we don't know. But there's a very good chance it was a man called the Reverend Charles Kingsley. I don't know if Charles Kingsley is uh, familiar to you. He's, he's, he's famous for having written a, one of the most ghastly Victorian children's books of all time called The Water Babies. Um, Water Babies was very useful in my career because when I was given it to read at about the age of eight, it showed me that teachers and parents could actually be extremely stupid. This was the worst, mer most meretricious, sentimental, ghastly book I ever read. And you know what? Here I am. I still can't get it out of my system. <laughs> anyway, so what did Darwin do? Well, he added a little epigraph at the beginning from a book by Samuel Butler, uh, in which, he, which Samuel Butler tries to define what is natural. And what is natural is, if I may find the place, um, oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, what is natural as much requires and presupposes an intelligent agent to render it, that is, effect it continually or at stated times, as what is supernatural or miraculous does to affect it for once. He's saying that it's an edging backwards to, to natural theology again. Now, he does also say, I don't see any good reason why the views given in this volume should shock the relig religious feelings of anyone. A celebrated author and divine has written to me that he has gradually learned that it's just as noble a conception of the deity to believe that he created a few original forms capable of self-development into other and needful forms, as to believe that he required a fresh act of creation to supply the voids caused by the actions of his laws. That probably was Charles Kingsley, and that too, on his side, it has to be said that he was one of the first Church of England clerics to accept the idea of Darwinian evolution the other one being the Reverend Baden-Powell, the professor of geometry at Oxford, who was the father of Baden-Powell, the founder of scouting. But then he made another addition, and this is what is really upsetting. You remember this phrase, there is grandeur in this look, view of life with its several powers having originally been, having, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, now, it read in the second edition, there is a grandeur in this view of life, having been originally breathed by the creator. 
into a few forms or one. What in the first edition he had left as open to interpretation, was it literal or figurative, had now been answered. It was literally breathed by the creator. A big difference or a small difference? He was mortified by this. He never got over the fact that he had succumbed to this pressure and had, had, had catered to convention. He wrote to his friend Hooker, I have long regretted that I truckled to public opinion and used the Pentateuchal term of creation, creation by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. It's mere rubbish thinking at present of origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. And there are lots of other letters like this. It's, it's sort of interesting to wonder why it must have been something to do with Emma that, that persuaded him to add that. But he always realized that he dug himself into a, a hole that he couldn't get out of. And for the rest of his life, he was completely ambivalent on the question of religion. Uh, my theology is a simple muddle. I cannot look at the universe as a result of blind chance, and yet I can see no evidence of beneficent design, or indeed of design of any kind in the details. In other letters, he had talked happily about design. <coughs> and finally, he said, I can hardly see how religion and science can be kept as, kept as distinct as the Reverend Pusey desires. But I must wholly agree that there is no reason why the disciples of either school should attack each other with bitterness. And this was the big problem. Once he had published The Origin, people took up cudgels on both sides, and the debate became extremely vituperative and very unpleasant. And of course, everybody constantly tried to enlist him on their side. And so for the rest of his life, which was 30 years, he was constantly dodging from one foot to the other, trying to avoid being sucked in by some clever ploy into uh, endorsing some particular view or other. And he never did. He stayed completely neutral in the de great debates that arose after, but the personal cost, the tax that was paid in having come to this question of how he would resolve the issue of science and religion and, as I said, blinking rather than sticking to his original guns or indeed coming out wholeheartedly for a religious point of view, continued to eat at him and, as you know, he was one of the most unwell physically people uh, of the 19th century. So both Jefferson and Darwin were very private people, and that's part of the issue too. Both were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. Not religious enough for some people, too religious for others. Jefferson backed away from science by giving up geology, and Darwin compromised ever so slightly. Now, this isn't the conflict between science and religion uh, that's often presented, which is the contest between two great authorities going, butting head to head. This is the process of testing new knowledge against old, which happens in every field, not just science and religion. And it happens every day, and it happens all of us. Some people can close their minds, and some people, which I suspect is the majority of us, continue to worry. Now, in my next lecture, I'm going to see how after 1860, we move from the individuals that we've been talking about to how authority came to join the debate, and literally the debates, because I'm going to talk about the Wilberforce-Huxley-Oxford debate of 1860, and also the much less well-known debates in Massachusetts, uh, which actually preceded the Wilberforce debates. And along the way, I will try to discover for you whether Thomas Henry Huxley actually had an ape for a grandmother. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, oh, yeah. Ooh, double barrel question. That's a real bear trap. Second part, has science shown that there is no need for the hypothesis of a selective value for a religious belief? Um, I'm not sure that you can say that. Um, I think you could well argue that there's a very strong selective advantage, societal advantage, um, in a religious belief for a lot of people and for society, for societies. Um, you could also argue that it's not necessary, um, that everything had been said by Aristotle anyway on the subject of morals and ethics and whatnot. But on the other hand, um, as I said in my first lecture, in, in, a, in a way it doesn't matter if enough people believe in God, then it's something that you have to take, it, take it into cognizance every time you, you, you open your big fat mouth, which is what I've been doing today. Um, but there is a considerable, um, an, an active and, and still very contentious b a, a group of people uh, trying to show that uh, moral behavior and including a belief in a higher power is something that can be actively selected for as a result of sort of, put it crudely, the enlightened self-interest of small related groups of people. Um, that in, in that, that that's, that selective regime, there is, there, it's perfectly possible something like that uh, could, could arise and be maintained because there is, a, 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 there is an advantage. So this is one of the places where science is, if you like, running up against religion again, uh, again by trying to explain in purely material terms something that it seems uh, more, um, in the that used to be more in the realm of morals and ethics rather than atoms and, and, and chance. Um, so, so I think the answer is, um, well, th there are a lot of people working at this. And so, <laughs> I don't be, want to be flippant, but there is the joke about the Southern Baptist preacher who was asked if he believed in infant baptism. And he thought for a moment, he said, I've seen it done. <laughs> so in this case, <laughs> it's perfectly possible, yes, but very difficult because the scientists have not yet, if they're ever going to nail it down, they certainly haven't nailed it down now. Other questions? Uh, lately, I, 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 I do read a great deal of, about this, this issue that you mentioned, and what, lately I, I've been thinking a lot of it about how belief as distinct from faith um, is sometimes disclosed as a, a to me as, as where the accent is on the commitment rather than it being an epistemic statement. I mean, a statement belief of belief often says, I don't have enough evidence to convince you of this, and so I'm going to use the word I believe, or it may mean I question the whole um, epistemological structure of this discipline that I'm talking about and therefore I'm going to just say I believe it is this sort of there's some sense of commitment and I've as a as a very you know liberal religionist I I, I still sometimes admire fundamentalists whom I would do, disagree with often because there seems to be this sense of commitment and fidelity and I'm going to stand by God no matter what anyone says and I wonder with Darwin whether there is some kind of struggle like this where from a, from a epistemological point of view, he's saying, I, I can't add this up, but he still has some sense of commitment. I think that's right, yes. And I think I would agree with you also about sort of envying the, 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 those who are absolutely certain. And he, <coughs> but he, I think just the fact that he, he had the sort of mind that constantly probed into every direction. Uh, he, he couldn't find a certainty that he could hold on to. Um, that's the best way I can put it. But, but the word believe is actually, it's actually fascinating to me because um, people will say, I believe in evolution. And I've, I've never know uh, people are accused of believing ev in evolution. And it's, it's, it's Again, we're, the, what we know is a mixture of 
what we actually know from personal experience and what we, we have from others. And so when we say we believe in evolution, uh, at least the layman probably means I accept, possibly for the time being, I accept uh, the theory of evolution. But I think when people anywhere in, on a scientific subject say, I believe this particular piece of science, I think it does the whole system a terrible disservice. So I, I'm, I worry with you about this, this difference. <laughs> Because it does seem to see that, you know, okay, well, maybe it's just an item of faith with these people. They, they don't actually know anything. They just believe in evolution because pff, it's fashionable or something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, didn't Darwin uh, eventually attach some credence to Wallace's argument that um, natural selection couldn't account for the evolution of brains that could do trigonometry, that is, uh, savages didn't need this, and, and therefore there was no evolutionary pressure to have it. An argument we would now consider racist, but was uh, uh, widely believed in the 19th century, and didn't Darwin eventually come to attach some credence to that? Didn't, didn't Darwin what? Didn't he eventually attach some credence to this argument? Didn't he accept it to some degree? Um, <clears throat> not by the time he came to write The Descent of Man, no. He was... Uh, no, definitely not. I, I, not in my reading, anyway. I believe he, he, uh, he was perfectly... Because the whole thing was gradation for him. So you didn't just start with trigonometry. You started with something much simpler and simpler, and then you built and you built and you built. So that wasn't a problem for him, I believe. And certainly that's not what he writes in The, in the, in the Descent of Man. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that Darwin was writing um, a quasi-theological rather than a scientific, um, with a quasi-theological quasi angle, um, or at least that's what Reverend Pusey said. Um, I was wondering what are the implications of that, like accusation, and or what was, um, what were um, Reverend Pusey's implications? I think it was it was. Um I think it was, the, in, in a way, it was the ultimate put down. He was this great preacher um, uh, dismissing Darwin's great science as quasi theology, amateur science, uh, quasi theology, sort of amateur theology. Um, but also, it was straightforward that he was committed to this theory of special creation, and Darwin. And so were the vast majority of, of the population of, uh, of Britain, and indeed, I'll show, uh, in the United States at that time. So it was, um, it was a serious affront to his whole philosophical viewpoint that Darwin should have attacked this. Um, and because it was a quasi-religious theory, the theory of special creation, then it was you sort of finish up accusing Darwin of having written a quasi-theological book. And so he was furious because it wasn't intended as a theological book, although it was intended as a put-down of a, a theological theory. So it's, um, <laughs> it's a problem. But I think it was partly a put-down. Uh, Pusey need to, needed to use every, every stratagem to uh, discredit Darwin. And interestingly enough, it didn't appear in the sermon itself. He wrote it in a footnote to the published version of the sermon that appeared two days later in the, in the Guardian newspaper. Sorry, can I just ask yeah. um, a follow-up? Um, do you think that Darwin could have written it in, in a, a purely scientific angle that didn't have any quasi-theological like tone? Say, say it again, I'm sorry. Do you think that Darwin could have written um, Origin of Species or um, any of his other works from a purely scientific angle rather than quasi-theological? Yes. I think he thought that's what he did. Um, he scientifically destroyed a theological or quasi-theological theory, but he saw himself as writing uh, purely as a scientist. That's, that's the rub. Do you, do you think uh, Darwin had a conceptualization of the huge impact of evolutionary theory on biology to where perhaps these compromises he may have 
uh, done with regard to inserting creator uh, into the discussion would essentially be forgiven by history and would, in a sense, have no impact on uh, evolution being accepted by, by biologists globally, near immediately as it was? Um, well, let's put it this way. The, the scientific content of his writings, is both the, the origin and the, particularly the Descent of Man, which was very, a very revolutionary book, uh, was so strong that you could read all of that and never, and just not notice that he ever used the word creator, or even that he bothered very much with the theory of special creations. If you read it from a particular viewpoint, you just, just read it straight through. Um, he certainly was a, uh, hoped that the theory of natural selection would spread out and explain, as I, I said, this, uh, this great system of nature, that it would ex explain everything. And by the time he died, it really had gone a long way to, to doing that. People had picked it up in, in every possible respect. Um, so by uh, sort of 1860, there was already a social Darwinism uh, applied to the history of uh, European countries, for instance. Uh, it, it really did take, over, take off very fast. And I think it's only in retrospect that uh, it's interesting to reconstruct Darwin's life and see how what he seemed to be doing so effortlessly in so many accounts of Darwin, uh, he, what seemed to be so effortless, it was actually uh, achieved at this enormous personal cost of torment and conflict. Um, and then I like to turn that round and say, well, that's not so very different from what we do on a much more minor scale that we have to do all the time ourselves whenever we come across with something that doesn't quite fit with what we've been told. Um, but the, I think the, the, there was this view that it was also effortless, and now the view of Darwin is that he, he, this was a man who was absolutely tortured, and pretty much from the moment in 1838 when he realized he had the idea and married Emma. <laughs> Did Darwin know much about what was going on in biblical scholarship in Germany in the 19th century where there were people who were making distinctions about sources and treating the biblical text quite differently than what he had <coughs> learned in England? Well, you know, that, that's, that's fascinating because I, 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 I talked about this a little bit with respect to whether Jefferson did. In, in, and, and it was clear that he did, because he wrote to Adams saying he, 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 pretty much exactly that. Um, he, there's, there's nothing in his writing that suggests it very much. There's the, there's the odd thing that appears in the autobiography about the, uh, um, the, the Bible being, you know, and the rainbow sign all being nonsense, like the, the, the books of the Hindus and whatnot, which would be offensive nowadays. But... Um, he has to have noticed because, as I'm sure you're leading up to saying, in 1860, the book Essays and Reviews was published in which the German scholarship, uh, particularly of Christian Bunsen, was just thrust into the middle of this huge argument uh, within the Church of England. And uh, how could he not have noticed this? I mean, when it finishes up with ecclesiastical trials for heresy and whatnot, I mean, this is a huge deal. And his... Teachers at Cambridge certainly were well aware of this because um, in Buckland, uh, sorry, this is a bit technical, I'm sorry, but in Buckland's Bridgewater, Bridgewater Treaties volume, the same Reverend E.B. Pusey, as a young man, uh, tells Buckland that it's okay because the word made doesn't mean created out of nothing. Uh, the Germans have told us that it's all something different. Um, so. He has to have known. I think it's simply a subject that he didn't care to engage, and he didn't need to, to produce it as evidence for his point of view. So he surely knew about it, but he didn't, he didn't bother to drag it up. Uh, but funnily enough, I'm going to talk a bit about that in my next, <laughs> next lecture.